So this morning I get to preach on a parable, and I love parables, they're my favorite thing. So first, um, we're going to read our scripture. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20, uh, starting in verse 1. And I will be reading from the NIV version. Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1, and we're going through chapter 16. And it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and each received a denarius. So when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked for only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered to them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am gen generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is one of those scriptures that I really want to make commentary while I'm reading it sometime. Uh, because there are things in here that uh, always stand out to me. Um, so let's, let's take a little trip <coughs> down memory lane, okay? And think back to your childhood, and if that seems too long ago, you're... <laughs> you can think of uh, uh, your children or your grandchildren. Um, think of the things that children say, and after a moment of reflection, we name what you think they say perhaps more than anything else. Maybe I love you. I heard no out there. That is, no is heard a lot from children. Why? Oh gosh. We've had several toddlers in our toddler room in the uh, daycare enter the Y stage. Every, every time you even answer, the next word is why. Just because it is. So. Um, now, the we're adults, we know how it is important to say three little words like, I love you. However, there are also three little words that are often said. That's not fair. Uh, just this week, um, my sister relayed a story about her own children, and she had no idea that this is what my subject was. Um, but she had all her kids are in the car, and she I just picked up her middle child from occupational therapy and had gave him some candy because he actually did what he was supposed to do in occupational therapy. So it was a reward. And her youngest started throwing a fit because, well, she wanted candy too. However, um, she... she She's a new kindergartner, and she's had a couple of rough drop-offs this week, including 
one that involved calling the police because she escaped. So, so my sister is like, well, you can get a treat if you actually go to school and stay there. Um, so of course, the oldest says, hold on, wait a minute. That's not fair. I don't get anything. So my sister's decision was finally, nobody gets anything. You have to make it <laughs> And the funniest thing to me when she's telling me the story is that guess who said that's not fair the most in my family? My sister. And we always hear from my mom, well, life's not fair. And it's not. And it's not supposed to be. And sometimes that's a bad thing, and sometimes that's a very good thing. But we know this that we're all born with this idea of fairness. It's a one, powerful and wonderful thing because uh, when it developed into maturity, it's our foundation for justice and equality. It's what makes us ask those questions. It's not fair that some can vote and others can't, that some would ride in front of the bus while others must stay in the back, that other people get paid more for the same work, or that some people get go to bed hungry while others throw away food that were bad in their refrigerator. So our innate sense of fairness is what leads to this strong and life-giving sense of justice. But that's not always true, is it? Because sometimes our innate sense of fairness tends to be somewhat egocentric or me-centered. We tend to assess fairness as an example, uh, if you could think of your childhood, in terms of what seems not only fair to us, but for us. You can see this a lot in the daycare when one child says, it's my turn. I haven't got a turn yet. And I say, you just had a turn. <laughs> a turn means letting somebody else have a turn as well. So you can't have two turns in a row. But that idea, it's all about me, what I want. So we tend to make it to your fairness in only terms of what I want, what I need, what I hope, what I expect, and very often with um, regard for the wants and needs of others. That's in childhood, and sometimes that does not end in childhood. Um, which brings us to this parable. So, right up front, it's important to recognize uh, how tough it is to be a day laborer. That's who these guys are. They're out in the marketplace waiting to be hired. They have no regular employment, and they stand in the town square hoping that some landowner or a manager with extra work will hire them. The trouble is, there's a lot more laborers than work. And so there's unemployment, and back then there would have been no social services to fall back on. So if you were born healthy, lucky. You got chosen and you worked a 12 hour day, and you received your day's wages, and then you would provide food for your family for the next day. And if you were unlucky or unhealthy, however, you'd be passed over, and you'd possibly wait all day only to return empty-handed to those who depend on you. Um, in this parable, everybody gets lucky. Some are chosen early, some more late in the morning, at noon, mid-afternoon, and some just an hour before quitting time. Uh, no doubt, the last men were somewhat pleasantly surprised that they received a full day's wages for an hour of work. And not because they hadn't wanted to work all day, but because they hadn't. Because they hadn't wanted to work all day. 
After all, they've been out, they've been there just the same as others, ready, willing, and eager. They had been passed over time and again until right near the end. And so I suspect they were delighted to discover that they would be able to provide at least another day for their families. This act of generosity, however, set up some expectations, right? Those who started first were doing their mental calculations when they saw how much someone who worked for one hour got. They were adding up and anticipating how much more they would receive. And to be honest, I can't blame them. After all, if the folks who worked just one hour's wage got a full day's wage, wouldn't it only be fair to give those who worked 12 hours long a little more, or maybe a lot more? It would be fair, right? Um, but that's not what happens. They receive a full day's wage, nothing more, nothing less, because that's what they were promised. They are disappointed, maybe even a little angry, and it just doesn't seem fair. But the landowner reminds them that in fact it's totally fair they were paid what they were promised. If anything, the landowner is being more than fair. He's being generous to those who came late. And as well as being perfectly fair to those who were fortunate enough to be called to work early. So why then begrudge such generosity? Perhaps because that's who we are as humans. That is our human nature, our fallen nature, to be precise. So when we see the story of the fall in Genesis 3, it can be read that a certain way. Um, that it's a story about how our own security and lack of trust we came to assess, understand and assess our lives not through the abundance that we had been given by God, but by what we still felt we lacked. Because this gnawing sense of lack, we define ourselves over and against others, comparing and begrudging good fortune because it wasn't our good fortune. Think about that for a moment. Instead of delighting in the good fortune of those who came late, those grumbling day laborers were grumbling. Rather than feeling fortunate to have found a work for the day, they feel unfortunate at having not receiving more. Rather than rejoicing for the other workers and for their their blessings, they can only begrudge them, perhaps even curse them for their good fortune. And rather than being grateful to the landowner who has given them an honest day's wage for an honest day's work, they can only grumble with resentment. those who deem themselves righteous consider those who almost by any standards were not. Those who were righteous be begrudged those who were not the grace and mercy of God and the intention of God's Son. But there's also another dimension to this that speaks to uh, truly to us in our own time and our lives as it did to Jesus' original audience. Because this parable lays before each and all of us a choice as clear as can be. When we look at our lives, do we count our blessings or our misfortunes? Do we pay attention to the areas of plenty in our lives or what we perceive lack? Do we live by gratitude or by envy? Do we look at 
Do we look to others in solidarity and compassion or only see them as competition? The killer thing about this choice is that it's really a choice as unavoidable as it is simple. You just can't be grateful and envious at the same time. So which is it going to be? Jesus is eventually killed precisely because he offers this choice. That is, Jesus is crucified not just because he proclaims the grace and mercy of God was available to all, even to those deemed incredibly unworthy, but also because his declaration revealed the hardness of heart, the stone-cold entrenchment of spirit that is part and partial of the human condition. He was inclusive, boundary-breaking. He had generosity. He revealed the envy and competitiveness, competitiveness of those in power. His vision of, uh, was of another way of being in the world. He called it the kingdom of God. And um, he betrayed, this kingdom of God betrayed the lie told by protectors of the status quo that was theirs and was the only way. Shamed by such a vision and unable to embrace it, they put the visionary to death. But this parable is also about the generosity of God. It is not about equity or proper disbursement of wages, but about a gracious and undeserved gift. It was about bestowing grace and mercy to all, no matter what time they have put in or how undeserving or deserving we may think them to be. God's generation of, God's generosity often violates our own sense of right and wrong. Our sense of how things would be if we ran the world. And um, are we able to celebrate another's good fortune because we have not celebrated our own? How often am I ungrateful for God's graciousness and mercy? How often do I deny God's love and forgiveness in my own life? Sometimes we can do that just by forgetting that it's there. Jesus leaves us with the question, can we learn to see through the eyes of God? Our ideas of right and wrong, of what is just and unjust, are not necessarily God, God's ideas. And that sometimes is a very good thing. We remain, oh, we are reminded, it's misspelling, we are reminded by this parable that the tables are turned. When we look for equity, we are surprised by generosity. You and I are invited to challenge and challenge to look at where we see ourselves in Jesus' parable. The parable reminds us that God is a lousy bookkeeper and invites us to transform our pride, envy, and hardness into joy by admiring and celebrating God's astounding generosity. It also invites us to look at ourselves honestly and lovingly as God looks at us. It invites us to turn away from holding grudges because things did not go our way and to let go of the stuff of our lives that keeps us from being joy-filled and grateful people. So, uh, I have an activity for us to do. We're going to learn how to let go. Everybody needs a two note card.
I did several years where I did object lessons every Sunday. I haven't been able to do one yet, and I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, so activity. So, you have one note card. In one note card, I need you to write some resentment, resentment or some grudge that you hold in your heart. And on uh, something um, you believe they, that you lack or something that you are envious of. And please be honest. Nobody's going to look at you but you. Okay? Honesty matters. And then on your other note card, write some blessing uh, or some area of abundance, something for which you are grateful for. It could be in your own life or in the life of someone else. And when you are done, I want you to actually hold your note cards, one in each hand. All right, right? On one note card, I need you to write um, some resentment, some grudge, something you believe you lack, or something you are envious of. And then on the other note card, write uh, a blessing, an area of abundance in your life, something you're grateful for, someone you're grateful for, that's also a big word of blessings. Hard to think, isn't it? Sometimes. All right. When you have them in your hands, I want you to think about which one weighs more. Um, 
And I think some people, if you hear it today, is get over it. And there's a certain wisdom to that. That doesn't mean that we just get over it. It means that we work through things and then we let them go. As long as we hold on to it, we continue to hurt others and ourselves. God forgives and loves us, and we must also forgive and love ourselves and others. Grace, gratefulness is at the heart of our faith. Will we always be true to our choices? Uh, perhaps not. But hopefully the exercise with the card can help you be more true. In the end, the only one who is true is the one who came preaching, teaching, and embodying this new life and kingdom. The one who is willing to die that we might see and believe that this new life is possible. But let's be clear. While this one is true, he is not fair. Jesus is not fair. Because he gives us more than we deserve. Loving us from death of scarcity and fear to a new life of abundance, courage, and faith. And thank God that life is not fair. Now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave today, help remind us that life is not fair. That you have given us so much more than we could ever ask for or possibly dream of receiving. Just help us remember to leave those uh, grudges and resentments behind and to remember to be grateful for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.